those who have not been here, it is quite a challenge to get this microphone going rightly without scaring you off and not being able to listen anymore. So I'm switching it on now. Hold your ear. The first time, the other one is broken, that's why. And it cost over a $1,000, so we bought a cheaper one. That's what you get, right? <laughs> yeah, like a, I was scared myself. I don't look scared, but I, I, was, I was scared. I think it works, right? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's Revive happening. They're already out. Revive Youth. Yeah, Daniel. Check it out, man. Who's doing it today? Waiting for you. All right. I'm reading from Ephesians 6, verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish. Yes, Elijah, you too. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. We are in the midst of looking at the armor of God and already have passed to the essentials, uh, looking at the essentials, which, is, which are the, tr the truth belt, the plate of righteousness, and also the feet fitted with readiness, which comes from being at peace with God. So if you're at peace with God, getting up in the morning, if you're at peace with God, hey, you got a good start already right there. If God is for us, who can be against us? There is, of course, when we look at the shield of faith, a faith that is already planted in our hearts as believers with our new birth, our start in this new life with Jesus. And this faith is deeply rooted. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. It's a gift. Faith is a gift, not a result of your works. It's by faith. But in addition to this type, this, this original, this faith that connects us with God, there is also a faith that is like a shield of a soldier. Because it says here, and that's what you have to do, take up, take up the shield of faith. So it's not the faith in God that's opening up and down again, right? So it's, it's a different type of faith. It's a faith that we need in our everyday. So we pick it up. Like a shield of a soldier, he, he has to pick it up in order to be ready. You need to grab it and use it according to the need of use in action. This shield is especially important for the use of guarding us, so the word, from flaming arrows of the enemy according to the Bible. The shield guards us from the flaming arrows of the enemy. In preparation to the sermon part for today, God put on my heart to give practical Bible examples, not Hollywood examples, but practical Bible examples displaying to us the severity of the devil's attacks. So I will do that. Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert. Similar to the temptation of Adam and Eve in the garden, he questioned God. But this time he did not just question what God said, he actually questioned the person God, Jesus 
Christ, God's Son. Because he says in this text, Luke 4, if you are the Son of God. Is Jesus the Son of God? Amen. The question is just ir irrelevant. Right away there, you know something's not right. And if anyone knew about Jesus being the Son of God, it was the heavenly realm. God, the Father, and every invisible spirit knew that the Father had sent his Son 30 years before this happened. And we just celebrated Christmas. And now he appears again, Jesus, wants to minister, do what the Lord has sent him to do. And the first thing that happens before he even really starts or proclaims or appears in public is the devil coming and trying to stop him right there with a question, if you are God's son. You know, Jesus should have said, you should know better. Because you, you know that I'm God's son, that's why you're here. That's why you're tempting me. If you are God's son, tell the stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scripture says, people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Jesus replied, the scripture says, you must worship the Lord our God and serve him only. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple, the worship house of God, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. I have no idea how many people had that temptation and failed to pass. For the scripture says, he will order his angel to protect and guard you, and, then, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity. In other words, this was not the only time that Satan tried to bring Jesus down or stop the mission of salvation for the whole world. With having in mind what was at stake here, we can somewhat assume how extremely tempting these attacks must have been for Jesus. I would say they were probably the most severe attacks in all of history of mankind. Of course, we were not in Jesus' sandals. We can't really tell. The other must have been Peter's attempt to keep Jesus from going to the cross. And this should not happen to you, he said to him, caring about the man. And Jesus addresses the evil mindset of Peter, a mind misled and messed up in that moment by Satan intrigues. Very obvious. Because Jesus said to Peter this famous but still for us harshly sounding words, Satan, get behind me. I don't know if there's one in this room who have not used that phrase yet to someone. <laughs> they were someone who was annoying to them. You know, like maybe you thought it only. Pick a number, maybe is the other word for that. We can see here how evil is often not displayed in aggressive attacks but in sweet talk. 
Oh, Jesus, you should not need to do that. I don't want you to be harmed. Don't go on a mission trip. You should rather go on a cruise. Don't overwork yourself. It's not worth it. Life will go on without you sacrificing fun and pleasure for the church and the Christian faith. Don't do that. I mean, well, the care for yourself. Sweet talk. Keeping us to do what the Lord asked us to do. All good, all good stuff. But in that moment, used wrongly. Remember, Satan used Bible verses that I would use as a promise from God. But at the wrong time. It was to harm God's kingdom in the plan of salvation. Here comes another story, which is an example of some intense damages of Satan's more aggressive destructions. Remember, the enemy comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. So even if the facade looks different, sometimes it is smooth intrigues, sometimes nasty, scary, bloody attacks, the result will still be the same if we give in. Destruction of God's creation, keeping the kingdom of God from expanding. Sometimes he uses illnesses. Sometimes he sends on one of his fallen angels. And for whatever reason, however this might happen, they take over the control of a person's life. We don't, don't even want to talk about this anymore. We are in, in, in the civilized North America. But here's an example of the Bible, as God asked me to talk to you about. They went across the lake to the region of the Ger 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 Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, the tra other translation must have a different word there, you know. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to know. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained, uh, 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 been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. <laughs> in God's name, really? Don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, Come out. Of this man, you impure spirits. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? Talking to that spirit in the man. My name is Legion. He replied, For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting he there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to, to go with him. 
But Jesus did not let him and said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. See, here Jesus is led to find this man and to confront the enslavement of this man with faith and authority in order to set him free from the devil's dominion over him. This man obviously couldn't do that himself anymore. And he also did not have enough friends or even anyone left in his life who could have brought him to Jesus. Think about that. No one was able to bring him to Jesus. There was no hope for this man. But Jesus found him. Listen. Jesus found him there. This is Jesus. This is what he does. He finds people when no one else can help them anymore. He finds them. There's hope for those you think are not able to be helped anymore. Jesus will find them. Have some faith. Have some faith in Jesus. He will find them. No one can help anymore, and you know those people in your family or surrounding. No one can help him. You have no idea what Jesus can do. He goes detours. He sacrifices his time and his schedule to find the one. Jesus found him. There was still hope even for a man like him. The heavenly father had seen him and the damage done in his life by Satan. And so he led his son Jesus by his Holy Spirit to find him for his salvation. Keep in mind, it cost an extra effort, a detour for Jesus to save him. Nobody had any idea why he would go there. That was not making any sense. But he did for this one man. With millions and billions of people on earth, he, he went to detour God's son for this one man. Trust the Lord. Trust him. The tool, the leash that the devil uses to get people more and more enslaved and out of control over their lives is sin. John the Gospel writer and beloved disciple and apostle of Jesus clearly states, but when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. And I think that is the, that, that's the more important part of this sentence. But the Son of Man came to destroy the works of the devil. That is the importance. Not all oh, these people keep on sinning, they are part of the devil. That might be true, but don't stop the sentence. He came, the Lord came to destroy these works. As he did with this man in Decapolis. This behavior pattern of keeping on sinning, being trapped by the sin, unable to shake it off completely, is not only a habit of some people, it is the stage of humankind altogether. And this is the true reason, again, why Jesus came. We cannot in ourselves free us from the pull of sin in our lives. We just can't help ourselves. You cannot behave yourself better to get rid of sin. You can't. 
There's only one cure for sin. It's Jesus. There's nothing else that can cure. But Jesus Christ, he's the only one. No behavior in the whole world, it doesn't matter how disciplined it is, will rescue you from your sinful behavior. It's only Jesus who can do this. Oh, he just has to behave better. That's not true. Only he and he can, absolutely can, save us and free us. It doesn't matter how severe the control of sin is in your life. He can free you. Amen. He can cut it all up. And he will, you will sit there as, it, as if it never happened. And all the years that the enemy has eaten up and stolen from you, he will restore. This is the promise of the Lord. And that's where our faith is built on, on the promises of our Lord. That's the strength in our battle against sin and the enemy and his schemes. We trust the Lord. He will complete what he has started in my life. He will. And that's why I keep on walking and did not throw the towel yet. Because when I look at myself and still see all the, the traces of sin that sometimes look like, like big mountains to me, for me personally, I know that God will keep his promises. He will completely set me free. And there will be nothing less. And, the, and on that day, the Bible says, on that day, and that's the day when I see the Lord face to face, I will be perfect. I will. In Jesus' name. I will. And there will be nothing else left. I will be still ashamed, but Jesus will see nothing but Perfect. And again, same sentence as at the beginning. It is not because of me. It is because of him. It is because of his doing. It has nothing to do with me. It is the grace of God who will complete within me what the Lord has started. Do not throw the towel. Stop doubting. The Lord will have a victory for you. This is our faith. That is why Jesus came to completely destroy the works of the devil in us. Works that make us sin again and again. Here's what Paul instructed Tim, Timothy to do, which applies to all of us who want to help people finding the truth and being set free by God's truth. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts, perhaps, and they will learn the truth. It doesn't guarantee it, but it can happen if you gently instruct. Mm, okay, no, well, that's fine. I'm just, I'm just telling Okay, you don't want to, that's fine, maybe another time. Then they will come to their senses, if perhaps happens, and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. He's not up there. No, this is Jesus. He is in charge. But this snake always tries to entangle us. And then there are people who are completely trapped still. And they're angry, obviously. Or it's not clear what will happen. The Bible doesn't tell us. That's why Paul says, be gentle with them. Just be just easy and maybe they will come to their senses 
and the, what, what will happen? They will, listen, then they will escape from the devil's trap. This is my prayer. My prayer list is long. And I don't know about you, but I pray with faith. There are some who are trapped in the devil's trap. And perhaps they will escape. There is hope there. I take the little and push it open and say, Amen in Jesus' name. Amen. One of our new workers at the youth retreat center in Germany arrived. You know, the center that Liz and I um, were called to lead in the early 90s. He came to me right after at the, the beginning of his term to let me know that he was convinced that he is still possessed. It was very interesting. It didn't have that that often. It was, that's, it was 24 years, 25 years old then. I don't know, until 24. And he kind of said, look, I'm possessed. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I didn't have that. Um, I didn't even have my license to preach yet. No 007 yet. Uh, I just, I was just an ordinary person like you. I'm still, hopefully, <laughs> an ordinary person like you. Caught us all right there for a moment. So he kind of said, and I said, okay, well, did you give your life to, yes. And did you receive forgiveness and were you set free from your sins of the past? Yes. I said, so who told you that you're possessed? Well, these people, they prayed with me. And then they, talking about gentleness, they, they took off their shoes and started to hit me on the head. <laughs> and they were not able to control me. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I, I said, okay, you know what? Let's do a test. Let's start praying. We'll see what happens. And I said to him, you gave your life to Jesus. Do not worry. You're fine. <laughs> Nothing happens to you. People w are so afraid of the devil. And he was so afraid. He, at the first time, like, and that was all because of some funny teaching that happened in those days. He was concerned that the devil would come and take over again. And um, there is a truth to that, and I will get to that with a story as well. Um, um, but not really. Um, so, so he was even... I love the, the guy, like, and he's serving Jesus, and he's married, he's, he's, he's awesome and healthy, like, great, great uh, brother in Christ. Um, but uh, he would play music. Um, actually, what he did is, um, and it's good that the Bible is also always very honest, and uh, sometimes it is shameful that the Bible is so honest, because we kind of say, well, we're part of the club, but it's just, don't go too hard on us in front of those people who don't really know what we're talking about here right now. Well, let, let's try this here. So, so he started praying in tongues and taped it with a cassette recorder those days. And then he would play it while he was gone so that his room would still be full of, of, of worship to God because he was afraid that when he comes back that maybe a, a demon has come in and just snuck in the corner of his room or something. And I said, okay, well, whatever it is, but this is not true. <laughs> and this is, I don't know where you got that from. Um, that's very interesting. I think it's, 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 it's interesting, but it's not true. Um, so here's the story from Luke 11. Um, from verse 14. And that says, Jesus was uh, driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, 
and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? Tricky, huh? Like, you, this is always very wise in answering th things. So, so then, they will be your judges. They, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, listen, this is the explanation of what he just said. It's important for all those who still try to figure this out. Um, it, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes to arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying this, the, the ladies then would say, um, um, blessed is your mother who gave birth to you and nursed you, and he replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And I get to that. A man who could not speak. And then here, right after the rescue, Jesus gives a key teaching about demon schemes. And we won't get all of this right away. Just one thing keep in mind. Jesus does not teach so we would become afraid. But so that we learn about these schemes so that we would not be careless but that we would have faith in God. That we would have faith in God. And consciously let our Lord rule and reign in our hearts and live in our hearts every day. Because if Jesus is inside, Satan cannot be inside. He can whisper lies, and we can go for it. He can mislead us and lure us into sin. He does those things. But the throne room of our lives, if it is given over to Jesus, will not be challenged as soon as Jesus is given the leadership and authority of our lives. It will not be challenged. The center of our lives in Jesus will not be challenged. You can't be born again into the kingdom of God and then later on reborn back into the kingdom of God. That's not possible. If you're born again, you, you die to yourself, you're born again into the kingdom of God, you cannot reborn again in in the darkness, in your old life. That's always dead. You cannot, you, you, you act as if it is alive, but the rebirth is solid. <laughs> you, you know, like, you think sometimes Jesus gives those examples and Paul and so on about reborn, so that we then go in our inter inter interpretations and screw it all up again. And say, well, that's not really true what he says, Jesus and, and Paul. The truth is, you can go back and be of a nature 
of one who belongs to the devil. You're already rebirthed over there. Romans 6 and 7. You die to the old self. That's the spiritual truth. That's the truth written, engraved in the heavens, it says. Jesus said to the disciples when they came back and was happy that even demons were um, submissive to them. Jesus said, do not be happy about that, but be happy that your names are engraved in the heavens. Not written. Engrafo. Stanced in there. We might screw up until the last day on earth. And I know what I'm talking about because I'm sitting at people's death life, deathbed, when they come around again and see, ha, as if through fire, as if through fire. No fruit in this life. Well, at least the rebirth was not taken from him. From her. Lots of material to, for discussion, absolutely. But keep in mind, if you're reborn into the new kingdom, it's not easy to be reborn back into the old kingdom. It's just not, that doesn't work. Paul says about one of his former fellow workers. Now, this will help you. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. He loved the world. Demas obviously was an easy target for the enemy. He just lured them away, not only him but others, from the ministry for Jesus in making the things of this world look more important, more attractive to them than serving God and being a blessing for others. Demas represents thousands upon thousands of Christians even today. It's obvious. It's not about having stuff or not. Paul says, I can be rich or poor. But I'm not aiming to be rich as a purpose of my life. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Say amen. amen. Please say amen to that. Not just material things and the comfort of this world is a tricky enticement of the opponent. Teachings contrary to the truth is a big one as well. Coming from people who supposedly are believers like us. It is all about getting the believers to putting aside the shield of faith. It's all about getting the believers to putting aside the shield of faith. Even good sounding teachings. And we have examples for that. Several times Paul warns his apprentice Timothy to be cautious about the teaching of other people so that he would protect himself and also those entrusted to him. Timothy, God, what God has entrusted to you, avoid, here comes, godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. Some people have wandered from their faith. They have put the shield of faith away because of those teachings of knowledge. They put them away. They don't need them anymore. By following such foolishness. Isn't that true? Knowledge, and I know you don't like that sentence, and Paul doesn't give any more explanation either, so there. Deal with it. 
Knowledge often replaces faith. Think about it. Knowledge often replaces faith. I know now I don't have to believe anymore. I already know. Let me know so that I can believe. <laughs> Knowledge replaces faith so often. And this is what he's saying here. So-called knowledge. Reasoning to the point of not believing in God anymore. Yeah, but you know, and uh, it's one million years and ten days and 50,000 billion, boom, and God is in there too. We have it all figured out. We know it all. And knowledge changes within time. Oh, well, now we know better. Well, as long as we don't start believing, people, please, don't believe. Just know, you know, we, because we know. Not believing in God for the supernatural care and protection anymore. Making faith a naive and unrealistic way of approaching life as a serious help. You can have God in your life, but it doesn't mean that you have to have faith as your God for your daily struggles and challenges. By real, you have to help yourself. God can't really help you unless you find a solution yourself. Divine intervention? Do you still believe those things? Who is that immature, lazy, and dreamwalking? God help those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. I hear it in this church sometimes. Not by you, by the others who are not here anymore. God helps those who help themselves. Don't say amen. It's a tricky one. But that's how we were raised from our upbringing. Oh, yeah, you believe, but God only helps those who help themselves. <laughs> Where is faith? It doesn't fit in that equation. Our, our, our upbringing was smarter than God. We have the knowledge. But then there are also other more severe corrupted teachings which first sound very serious and holy and accurate. But here Paul tells the preacher of the gospel, and I will conclude with this and continue on later next week at our communion service. The Spirit clearly says that in the later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Let's see what these demons whisper th in the ears of devoted Christians. Such, such teachings come through hypocritical liars. Wow, he's not shy. And, and, and naming them. Whose, whose conscience have been scared, seared, seared as with a hot iron. Well, they forbid people to marry. Do you ever hear that teaching in a church? They should not marry? No, you, if you serve God, don't marry. Paul says that. That is a, wait a minute, hypocritical lie. Oh, how dare him saying that? Because there are churches out there who teach that, even today. You know what he says? These are deceiving spirits taught by demons. Whoa. I think they'll kill him now. I hope he's sleeping on, you know, like, well, and, and is still alive next week to finish this sermon. Or their order 
of them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good. God is good all the time. All the time? Yes. And nothing is, sorry for stealing that, uh, for, and nothing is to be rejected if it is, uh, it just works so nicely, you know, like just there, when we talk about the goodness of God. Everything that is received with thanksgiving is good, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer, and we're talking about food here. You don't know what some cultures and countries eat. I wouldn't eat that. <laughs> But it's not a sin. It's not a teaching from the Bible that certain foods are not to be eaten. This is a hypocritical lie and is taught by demons. Paul says, think about it again next time you tell me you shouldn't eat pork meat. Oh, well, I just want to leave you off with some excitement for those who are into this kind of stuff you know just uh let's uh rest a little how about we stand up together again we'll continue next time lord we just hear um not in our own uh we we feel that you have drawn us to 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 come here maybe we 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 don't even notice it when we came but Right now, we know this is a good place to be in your house. It's a good place to, to hear your word, to, 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 to eat your word, and to help the, uh, to, 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 uh, please, that's our prayer, that you would help us with your Holy Spirit to process it, it to digest what we heard, to, to let go of the things that we did not understand, but to take heart those things that, really talk to us that the enemy as we sometimes hear about and even read in the bible that he would not come and steal away the good seeds but that this seed would fall into good ground as we prayed this morning before we started this this service that our hearts would be prepared for your word and good seed would bear fruit in our lives this week i bless you all with the reminder, daily reminder, to pick up the shield of faith so that you will be able to protect yourselves and even those who are entrusted to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. It's good that you were here today. Looking forward to next Sunday. I chat. I could do another two hours, but um, okay. <laughs> Get in trouble with the...